so um, the uh, we're going to look at the architecture overall. Then um, analy uh, what we uh, do in analytics area, um, an example for an application integrations, connectors, and uh, finally also how we deploy um, things in our infrastructure. So first of all, um, data at Lyft um, is essential uh, for the business uh, to operate and uh, specifically because um, if you're familiar with ride sharing you have an application and you expect the information to be up to date uh, the goal is to match uh, passengers uh, with drivers and um, we want to ensure that our users both uh, drivers and passengers um, have a good experience which means the ETA information that you see for your ride should be accurate and up-to-date. The pricing should be fair and drivers should receive uh, uh, fair earnings uh, and notifications should be timely. So uh, for also for the users, uh, we want to make sure that they are getting notified in a timely manner when there are changes in the conditions like traffic delays, route changes and so on. Um, here you see a few examples, for example, pricing. Uh, pricing can change, and I'm going to say more about that use case later, but also fraud uh, detection is uh, one area, and then just the general area of notifications for users and the overall experience um, in this application. So uh, looking at uh, the da data, uh, we have uh, different uh, user audiences, so there are data modelers, um, analysts, product managers, and so on. And in this uh, talk, we're going to focus more on two uh, of these audiences, data scientists and um, engineers. The overall platform architecture, uh, it starts on the left side with uh, the data that is being produced and being ingested, stored in a pubsub uh, platform in the form of streams, then um, processed by a stream processing engine eventually uh, landed in a permanent storage for offline analytics. Um, we also have, uh, you can see here, tools like uh, Spark and uh, Airflow, and also Flight, which is another scheduler for ETL uh, processing in batch. And then finally, uh, to make the data accessible interactively to users, uh, we have query engines, which uh, Presto is, uh, most work goes into Presto nowadays, uh, and then the front-end tools, finally, to make this accessible uh, to users. And um, our focus here is on the streaming side. So for the um, PubSub uh, system, so the transport of messages from a producer to a consumer, uh, we are uh, going from Kinesis to Kafka. Uh, Lyft traditionally had everything running on Kinesis, and there have been challenges um, as the business is growing and the data volumes are growing. Uh, also, the uh, requirements for uh, faster processing are also growing. So one uh, key um, issue is latency, where Kinesis has a very high tail latency. And uh, when you compare it to Kafka, uh, with Kafka we can have much faster and durable rides. And the emphasis is on durability. We want to achieve a good latency SLA, but also a reliable uh, system where we don't lose messages. And with Kinesis, it's hard. You have to trade one for the other, essentially. With Kafka, we don't have to make that choice. The second um, part is the fan-out limitation. Fan-out limitation means that with uh, how Kinesis is uh, set up and exposed to the users, there is a restriction to how much data can be taken out of a stream or a shard in a stream. And uh, because of that, it's not possible to do a fan out on a high throughput stream because there can only be one consumer, essentially, with the limits uh, that it has. Uh, even though uh, Kinesis makes some improvements with uh, the new 2.0 API, it's still limited to five consumers. But what you see in a Kafka uh, world very often is that you have many consumers for the same stream processing the data in different ways. So that's something uh, that we need uh, too. And finally, there's scalability limitation. Um, there are restrictions on the number of shards, and I believe the default is 500, but in, in a scale of um, processing we have at Lyft, we are in the thousands of shards. You cannot easily um, increase those, and it requires manual intervention. It requires approvals also for the account by uh, AWS. So, and at the end of the day, when you increase the number of shards, you also increase the cost. So those are all problems that we can overcome with Kafka. So for the streaming compute, uh, we are using Flink. And uh, Flink, um, 
has different API. Um, it has a SQL, a Flink SQL API. Um, you can write Java, uh, Flink jobs. Um, we are also using uh, Beam to make Flink available to other languages. I will say more about that uh, later. So uh, with uh, that, uh, we have a um, um, platform to uh, define processing workloads in uh, various ways. And Flink then needs to be deployed in the infrastructure, and that follows pretty much uh, the tooling that's uh, already there at Lyft currently for observability and um, other uh, aspects. And our deployment of Flink is currently a standalone cluster. That means uh, we have instances on EC2, and then we put the Flink uh, processes on those, the task managers and job managers. But that's not the future. The future uh, of deployment is Kubernetes, which we will take a closer look um, in a bit. So the Flink abstraction levels uh, that were shown there, you can write jobs using SQL, and a lot of effort has gone into SQL uh, lately, and this is uh, going to continue, uh, not just in Flink, but in other uh, systems too. Um, a level below that is your Java programmer, and now you write your um, data stream or um, data set, in the case of batch, Flink application with that, and requires programming, right? Um, and then even more flexibility and access to the state and uh, time and, and other details, uh, Flink provides those abstraction levels too. So depending on the use case, you can go down in the level of abstraction and gain more flexibility for more work and a higher skill set that is obviously needed uh, to work with it as well. About categorizing the use cases that we have at Lyft, broadly we can divide it into analytics, uh, streaming analytics, and then streaming applications. And in analytics, there are many use cases that have simple needs. Um, think of aggregation, simple ETL, simple ETL jobs where you just want to compute some aggregates and uh, then store them somewhere. So that can be expressed actually with Flink SQL. There's no need to write a Java program for it. And then uh, the Flink Table API uh, also gains a lot of attention now, and uh, so that's a good tool set to define a large number of simple Flink jobs without going into the programming realm. Uh, many things are automatic if you use those API. Uh, optimizations are done by the system, state and triggers and time are managed uh, automatically. Um, what you get as the user is a faster time, implementation time, and uh, in the case of Lyft, we have s combined a Flink SQL with a management platform that also takes care of all the deployment of Flink jobs so that to the user, there's no Flink, it's just a, a declaration for the job. On the other side, there are applications uh, that need programming, uh, complex use cases that are special, that require special logic and uh, more flexibility in the form of finer grain control, and those would be written in Java. The problem we have um, at Lyft is that most teams don't work with Java traditionally. A lot of it was done with Python. So, and, uh, so Beam is then the route to enable other languages on top of Flink. So uh, let's look at the analytics uh, first. Uh, the system, uh, we call it internally drift. Uh, the goal of the system is to enable feature generation broadly uh, in a unified way um, for machine learning. Uh, we want to have one system that can do that for um, bulk processing uh, to generate features for, for training mostly, uh, but also for the real-time processing for the current events um, for scoring or model inference. We are using SQL uh, to, uh, the user is using SQL rather to define what, this, what those pipelines should do, and then they give this job declaration to a fully managed service that will uh, ensure that it runs, gets deployed in the right way and runs uh, in, a, in a cluster. So this is what you would see as a user in that case. So there's a configuration file that uh, describes where the SQL um, query is, what the sources are, and what the features are that are being created. On the right side, this is something that is Flink SQL, essentially. So then there are two modes of execution. One is batch, quote unquote, because everything runs in streaming in this case, but it's semantically batch because it's a bounded data set of past data. 
or current data. And in the, in the case of processing old data, the data would come from S3. And the sync is maybe different from streaming. It could also be S3, where the results are stored. The SQL part in the middle is exactly the same. Now, looking at the real-time pass, the sources, uh, Kafka topic or Kinesis stream, the SQL statement remains the same, but the sync is something different. Maybe it's a new stream in Kafka, or it's a, a DynamoDB, or there are multiple options. But there's also an interesting case where historic data processing and real-time processing intersects. And um, when you um, think of the scenario, let's say you want to go back 60 days, and you want to compute a feature that needs 60 days of data. To do that, you need 60 days of data now to get an answer immediately, right? Because we have to go back in, in, in the past to even get an answer right now. That cannot be done with the current state of uh, PubSub, at least how we have it. Neither with Kinesis nor with Kafka because of data retention. So what we need to do is we need to have a hybrid source which you see here. Part of the data comes from S3, and then at some point it cuts over to the um, head data that comes through the PubSub system and computes the features. There are more details and the slides are shared, so you can take a look at uh, the presentation that is linked here. The benefits of um, doing things this way is that we enable low latency computation and streaming data. The teams that use it internally, they have a faster onboarding. They don't need to be Java programmers. The development time is uh, small. Um, and no awareness of deployment uh, to the user. Uh, they don't need to know how Flink runs on uh, the machines on, on EC2. Uh, it's self-serve, and uh, the goal is to be reliable, of course. On the other hand, application use case, and this is now specialized um, because um, when we look at it, we understand why. I mean, dynamic pricing is one use case. Dynamic pricing means that the price can change at a given location and time depending on the contextual information, supply and demand, uh, which are continuously evaluated. Uh, so if the market isn't balanced, then it's not good for drivers and not good for passengers either, because we may not get a car if there's too much demand. There are long wait times, and uh, drivers have no reason to uh, fill the demand shortage because they get paid the same price. So price is the level uh, to, to bring this uh, into balance. So prime time, we call this mechanism prime time. Prime time is a multiplier on the base price for a given location and time. And uh, to determine that multiplier, we need to look at uh, millions of geohashes. So geo the location is identified with a geohash, and we need to look at millions of geohashes uh, to uh, update this for every location, because the conditions are different at every location, and they change fast. So it's scale, and it's also latency that matters here. In the legacy architecture, this is a series of uh, cron jobs uh, that do staged processing. So in the stage one, some aggregation is performed, then the results get stuck into Redis. Then another cron job at fixed interval kicks off, takes those, does some model computation on an already trained model. Uh, again, stores some results into Redis. A third phase kicks off, computes the uh, information for the real pricing service and passes that on. Of course, this means latency on every stage. Uh, it's not data-driven, it's driven by a cron schedule, and the system architecture is fairly brittle because it's, uh, it cannot be easily changed. So, and in addition to that, adding new features is also difficult. Code complexity comes from the fact that we have uh, to write code for all this scheduling and coordination that normally you would not find in a streaming pipeline. So why not use streaming? When the team looked at it first, there was no Python for Flink. Uh, Flink has a Python API, but it's Jiten. It's not really Python. Uh, we need something where we can use the full C Python ecosystem of libraries uh, just as it uh, existed already. So. What can we do about that? 
is Apache Beam solves promises to solve that problem. It um, promises to have language portability, which means that you can choose the programming language that is appropriate for your use case. Now, something like the dynamic pricing, we don't want to write in Java because we already have the machine learning models, um, and the people working on it don't even know Java. So Beam can help here. The multi-language support became a rea reality over the uh, past couple of years. Uh, end of last year, it was possible to run Python on Flink uh, for the first time, um, which is what we need at Lyft. Uh, there is another SDK which is experimental right now, it's for Go, but uh, <laughs> in theory, uh, you can learn more about that SDK at, uh, at the Beam Summit uh, in a couple of days from the gentleman with the blue shirt in the back. Um, and uh, so there are some choices in language, right? You pick what is best for your use case. Maybe you have already written code, maybe you have some libraries, and uh, then you run it on your runner of choice, even if the runner is like Flink Java. So that's the, the beam, the promise of beam, and we are making progress on that path. If you write something in Python, it looks like this. Uh, so simple example, reading from a text, decide what windowing we want if we do an aggregation, define how we want to trigger results uh, with different types of triggers. There are three examples here. And the computation is just a summation and then write the results to a text. So just to give a feel of what you would see as a Python programmer. And you can, of course, then plug your user code in instead of doing a summation. You can perform some other function, call models, uh, use any library that you would like. Uh, running this on Flink looks, um, on the right side you see a Flink cluster, but before uh, we are ready to go to the Flink cluster, the client side is a Python program that you run, like any Python, other Python program. One parameter that identifies a job server. Now, this is a language boundary, so you're going from the Python world to the Java world in the case of Flink. Um, and uh, the way this uh, works is that the pipeline that was written in Python gets translated into a language agnostic format in Protobuf. Then it's being sent over that uh, endpoint to the, run, uh, to the job server, which contains the runner, the Flink runner. The Flink runner then takes this portable pipeline definition and translates it into its own job graph. It becomes a Flink job in the case of streaming a data um, stream job, and this is being passed over to Flink, like another Flink, any Flink application would run. But there, is a p p there are pieces of Python in that job definition, and they need to be executed somehow. They cannot run in a task manager, so we have these SDK workers. There are separate processes that know just to run the Python code. And they need to uh, communicate with the Flink side, which is Java, the, which runs in the task manager, and that API is called FN services with various planes to drive the execution. As records arrive, they are being passed over to the SDK worker. Results go back from SDK worker to Flink runner. Flink runner is responsible for the distribution. It's also responsible for the state management, for timer management, and everything. The worker is really just a, like a stateless service um, that is disposable that just executes records or bundles in Beam. So after the pricing system switch to Beam, it looks conceptually like this. It's simplified, but it's still reading data from Kinesis. And now for every record, it passes that on to the next function. It's data-driven, it's a pipeline, uh, filtering, aggregation, all of that can happen in an incremental way. There's no more cron scheduler here involved. It's just uh, the data processing graph. And no intermediate state storage is required because the data flows through the pipeline instead of using Redis as an intermediate hop past the data. So with that, they managed to get the latency reduction. And the interesting part about the latency is it still looks high, right, 30 seconds, but it's mostly bounded by the model execution now, not by the system around it, not by the uh, cron scheduler, or, or not by the streaming that is happening now. It's the model execution which would need to be worked on to get the latency further down, but it's possible. The model code could be reused, uh, well, no change uh, to it, but lines of code reduced because we got rid of all this boilerplate code just to stitch multiple jobs together. And uh, it was also with a 
reduction in the resources that are needed um, with the AWS instances. So now integrations. Integrations means the pieces that help you to get the data into your streaming uh, application and also write it out, sources and syncs in uh, Beam. Um, so we are using Flinx connectors, even in Beam we are using Flinx connectors because we did the work once to make those really work inside Lyft and now we try to um, capitalize on that effort. So um, we have exposed the Flink Kinesis consumer also as a Beam source in our, in our Beam fork. Um, we are planning to do the same for uh, consumer and, pro uh, and producer, but this is not only for Beam, this is for also for all Java pipelines. We use the same set of connectors. Um, we need to read from Kafka, we need to write to Kafka, we need to read from S3, we need to write to S3. We also need to write to Elasticsearch, we need to consume from DynamoDB streams, which is special Flink Chinese consumer. And then, very important in the Flink case, checkpointing. The checkpointed state needs to be written somewhere, which is S3 in the case, in our case. We had a lot of interesting uh, um, experiences and a lot of learning with uh, writing checkpoints to S3. Well, S3 may look like a file system to Flink, but it's not a file system when it really works. So here are some of the challenges. Uh, generally, connectors in Flink are pretty good, but um, usually you hit some bumps when it comes to certain production readiness aspects. Uh, we found um, issues with observability, which means that the metrics and the logs are helpful diagnosing issues. Also that we are able to configure everything uh, that we need or the conf underlying client API configuration parameters are exposed uh, sufficiently. And then also performance. When you run it at scale, you find things that uh, nobody has hit when you're the first one. Uh, so in, in the case of Kinesis, I think we were probably the first one running it at that scale level. Uh, AWS integration is also a little bit interesting because it behaves in unexpected ways. Sometimes there are transient service errors that are bubbling up and uh, if those are not handled correctly with retries, then it means that your pipeline is interrupted every time such a thing happens. It will basically fail, recover from a checkpoint. That means in the meantime there's no processing, which is of course not what we want. So what we want is identify those retriable exceptions and then just continue uh, with, a, with a retry and a small timeout. Uh, and um, dealing with S3 is also interesting for checkpointing with large state, uh, because if you hit the same uh, S3 chart for many subtasks, then you get the hotspotting symptom. And uh, there is a way to work around that with um, modifying, augmenting the file paths just to make it go over multiple shards. Um, that change went into the last Flink release. Um, and then also we need event time processing, it's really important. And so source watermarking, um, we added that to the Kinesis consumer in Flink. The Kafka consumer has that already, it wasn't there in the Kinesis consumer. Um, also that watermarking is done correctly while reading from multiple shards, merging data from multiple shards. Uh, the correct computation of the watermark is actually can lead to surprising effects if that's not done in the source. And uh, watermark skew, I'm going to say something about that problem um, because that seems to be a quite generic issue. Also, uh, I said at the beginning that with Kafka you can, you can process a lot of data very fast, which is true. Now you get the opposite issue with Kafka. Um, the bandwidth is so, can be so high to an individual consumer that the other consumers get starved. And uh, then you have to uh, think about rate controls um, on the consumer. So the watermark skew is the issue of the watermark of individual partitions in Kafka or uh, shards in uh, Kinesis not being aligned. That means one of those in this example gets consumed, or to, uh, gets consumed slower than uh, the others. And so you can see the red data is still being accumulated if this is a windowing use case, because the watermark has not advanced, but in the partition two and three, we are also reading newer data. So what is happening here is that you are accumulating state in the Flink application. And if that is large scale and that skew becomes very large, then it becomes a problem because the checkpointed state becomes so large, the application might come to a grinding halt on checkpoint, fail checkpointing, and at some point not process at all. And then there's also no way out of that because 
the consumer offsets are checkpoint, and then even if you restart, you will still have the same issue. So it is important that there is some synchronization mechanism, and this skew can be caused by a variety of factors. It could be a difference in the speed of the consumers. It could be a difference in the speed of the serving system, like Kafka Progress or Kinesis um, uh, shards. Or it could also be the density of the data. So it's, it's important to have this ability to align. So we implemented uh, this mechanism uh, of based on a global watermark that all uh, subtasks in Flink, all consumers are aware of. Uh, by knowing where everybody else is, so the minimum of all the watermarks, consumers can adjust their speed. So a uh, consumer that runs ahead can say, hey, uh, I need to slow down here, or I need to pause. I'm going to do this until others have caught up. Uh, so there's a little bit of a state sharing mechanism uh, that uh, is now part of Flink, that we utilize this, and then we have built this into the Kinesis um, consumer. To illustrate this, on the left side you see the skew, the effect of the skew. So in the middle uh, you see checkpoint size, and you see as the application is running, the checkpoint size is climbing. And the exact same execution on the right side doesn't have that problem. You see this is fairly flat. Uh, the right side is with synchronization, the left side is without synchronization. And when you look at the iterator age in Kinesis, you see that it, the band widens um, for, for, for the processing without synchronization because they are being consumed at different uh, speeds. And it, it, over time, it, it, wide, it widens. And this is a replay scenario where there are a lot of data is read in a shor short amount of time. Right? Um, and once it returns to the uh, head read, then it's flat. But on the right side, you can see that this band is narrow. The checkpoint size is, has a ceiling. And that's what we want to see. So that we can also replay large amounts of data without uh, running into memory issues. So we contributed that to Flink. Um, the next release will have the synchronization in the Kinesis consumer. We will build it also for the Kafka consumer. It's a bit more work because Kafka consumer, Flink Kafka consumer has a different consumer model compared to Kinesis consumer. But in the future, there's also Flip 27, which will provide a new framework for sources uh, in Flink that will um, account for all of these requirements to have a correct event time consumption. So now deployment. For deployment, we are moving from our standalone Flink deployment on uh, EC2 instances to Kubernetes. Uh, so everything at Lyft will run on Kubernetes eventually, which provides more stability, more flexibility, um, shorter wait times uh, when it comes to uh, starting up a new Flink deployment. Because a Flink deployment is always two things. Even if there's just one job running on it, it's always a Flink cluster and then a job that is running in the Flink cluster. For us, it mean, always means we are only interested in one thing. We don't want to run multiple Flink jobs in one um, Flink cluster, which has other issues uh, with isolation. So uh, the, we are building a Flink uh, operator that is open source. You can uh, go and check it out and uh, maybe even contribute to it. Uh, a Kubernetes Flink operator that understands how to manage Flink applications and uh, un supports its own uh, deployment descriptor that describes the Flink application. So you can see an example here. This is very simple, of course, but uh, it's a custom resource uh, descriptor that is understood by the uh, Flink Kinesis operator only, which is always active in the Kubernetes cluster. Um, it describes a single job. The, all the application code is packaged in a Docker image. That Docker image contains all dependencies. And we are using source to image internally to produce this. From There's a base image, and the users add their application code to it, and they get an application image that is then being specified in the uh, custom resource descriptor. Um, and uh, anytime uh, this descriptor changes, um, the operator has to update. So it could be any change. It could be a change in the parallelism, but it also could be a change in the code. And this operator needs to understand how to update a Flink job. Flink job is different from a microservice. Microservice, you can just change the replicas, and uh, everything will happen in the right way. A Flink job is a stateful application, so we need to do some more work here. 
This is an example. Uh, so um, the operator, the Kubernetes operator will detect the change in the CRD. It will uh, now go into an up updating state, uh, and that means it will have to take a save point because we want to carry over the state from the current running application to the new job that will be launched. Um, in parallel, it will create already the new Flink cluster, which is the new set of task manager and job manager processes, because we don't want to wait later. While it's safe pointing, it can already uh, create this new uh, Flink deployment. Uh, when the safe pointing completes, then we have everything that we needed to start the new version of the job. Uh, so the old one is now cancelled, the safe point was written. Uh, the new Flink job comes up from that save point on the new set of processes. And so that would be a stateful update. Um, the user should not be aware of the different phases that uh, this, um, um, that this uh, contains. Uh, we also currently have deployment tooling that is doing similar things, but with the uh, Kubernetes operator, this is nicely encapsulated and uh, more predictable. So finally, last uh, Beam Summit is coming up in uh, day after tomorrow. Uh, so if you want to learn more about Beam, then please uh, stop by. And any of the Beam things that I quickly run through here, you will get a great amount uh, of detail. Uh, there's also a Beam Summit coming up in North America in uh, September in Las Vegas at ApacheCon for the 20-year ApacheCon. So for those that came over here from um, North America or those that want to go there, this might be a good thing to bookmark. And we have a few minutes left for questions. Right, let's thank the speaker. <laughs> Other questions? So I have a question regarding your connectors. Uh, you mentioned you, might, you use uh, Flink connectors on top of Beam. Um, how do you enable developers like to test and debug their code? Do they usually have a local Flink instance running? Or do you have like another connector that they can use with the local uh, Beam runner? Yeah, this is a good uh, question. So uh, the, the way this um, currently works, the team that is working with Beam, they do indeed run the application. They have, um, for unit testing, they have a way to stop this and replace it with something else. For example, you can read from a file. A uh, file can also be like a stream and you can read some test data. So this way you can test the logic without actually having to have that connector. So that's one way of doing it. Beam gives you other options. You can uh, replace you're going to learn more at the Beam Summit about it. You can replace any transform with something else of your choice by just redefining how a URN gets translated. That requires surgery on the runner. This is what we do. When we see a lift kinesis consumer, then we know what to put in. We plug in the Flink kinesis consumer. So for if, if you're a developer, that's an interesting path because you can do pretty much anything. Uh, but the route forward um, for Beam itself would be cross-language transform, where you can use, you write your pipeline, your transformation code in Python, and then for sources you have the option to uh, use an existing Beam Java I.O., they are called. And there is an example that we will show um, day after tomorrow um, for Kafka, for reading from Kafka and for writing to Kafka. There's yeah. more questions. Hi, Thomas. Nice talk. Hi. So um, you were talking about how you wanted to unify uh, the feature engineering for both serving and training. And it sounded very much like you're building a feature store, but you didn't use that term. And TFX, which is kind of, the, as you know, the, the layer on top of Beam Flink for building machine learning pipelines, doesn't have a feature store. Can you say anything about your roadmap and, and what way you think it's going? Is it going the feature store way or the PFX pipeline way? Well, we are not doing that because you are already doing it. No, I'm just joking. Uh, so we, we do have a feature service, which is a separate system in Lyft. Uh, so the, um, the, the Flink um, jobs that are running there and using SQL as a specification, they will eventually output. Also, one of the things is actually a feature store, where these things are being stored and then consumed. But uh, you're right. I mean, this could be an interesting path in the future uh, to do uh, something like this based on uh, existing uh, tools. But this was created um, years ago, and this uh, current feature service, we call it internally, um, probably at some point it will be touched when the uh, systems that are coming up are mature enough. Yeah. Thanks. More questions? 
There's one here in the center. Thank you. Um, about the analytics uh, part, you said uh, some people can write pipeline only using SQL. So that's great because more people can uh, write pipelines. Uh, do you have any safeguards in, in case they don't like, fully understand what's going behind? Or it's just like the job is going to be super long, so they're going to figure out it's not the ideal way? Well, it, it, it's really, uh, it, the, the question is whether you can express what you want to do with SQL, really. And that's rather, that's basically independent of Flink. Can I express the computation that I want to do there with a SQL? And in many cases, the answer is yes, at least for us. Uh, what, what was written previously with Python, for example, doing just simple aggregations, uh, summations, um, with no special trigger conditions and so on. All of that can be expressed with SQL. And uh, most of the Flink jobs are actually, that we have at Lyft today, are in that category. Um, and it, the, the growth there is much faster. Because when you write a full-fledged Beam, uh, um, with Beam that's the case too, but a Flink Java job, there's a, quite a hurdle. You have to have somebody very familiar with Java and Flink, uh, first of all. And also, ha you have to have somebody who understands the, the deployment. When you open this wide range of options, how you write the code and what you have access to, uh, the flip side of that is that uh, there are many more things that can go wrong. And uh, so somebody has to support that. So yes, I mean, the, the use cases that can be served with SQL are many. And uh, the ones where you want to go down the programming route are hopefully few, because it requires way more work and time. All right, very good. Done. Now let's thank the speaker again. Thank you.